in Luke chapter 16. And we begin to wind down now. Luke chapter 16 from verse 19. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fed sumptuously every day. How many times? Every day fed sumptuously. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus full of sores who was laid at his gate desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. Note, he was desiring, but nobody gave him. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Note the, two, the difference. One man was carried to Abraham's bosom. The other one was what? Buried in the ground. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am, am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted and you are tormented. What point am I trying to draw from this, par for this uh, uh, parable? The rich man is the type of a synagogue of Satan. Lazarus is the type of the church of Smyrna. The rich man fed sumptuously every day. Those who have a synagogue of Satan, they only think of themselves. They don't think of the poor. They don't think of the needy. They only pray for themselves. They only pray for what they want. Their God is their own desire. They don't consider any other person but themselves. The world is always happy with them because they have something to give. The Bible says that the rich man has many friends, but the friends of a poor man, they are even running when he's calling them. Have people considered where they will end? Have you considered where you will end? People are planning. We are planning. We are planning. Near 2019 has come. What's the, what is the plan for this year? Have you planned for eternity? Do you know if you will make the end of year 2019? I see people greeting. Oh, happy New Year. Happy New Year. We have crossed. We have crossed. What does it mean? People crossed into the new year. And they died in that new year. The very first day of the new year, they died after they crossed over in church and shook hands. They died. Within two hours of shaking hands, of saying, Happy New Year, Happy New Year, they were dead. So what is the noise about? And then people begin to talk of the new year as if God is interested in the, in the, in the new year. In 2019, you must be holy. You must be holy 2019, 2018, 2017, whatever time. Holiness is not tied to a year. Righteousness is not tied to a particular year. It is your nature. You must live like that. I don't know what we are doing. Allowing people to deceive us and mislead us and misrepresent, and misrepresent God. A synagogue of Satan is like that rich man. Clothed in purple. Fine linen. Well dressed. Am I asking you not to dress well? Dress well please by all means. But we're not interested in your outward dressing. We're interested in your inner man. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 3, talking to women. It says, God is not interested in this outward doing of hair and of clothing and of putting on of jewelry and this and that. What God is interested in is the meekness of the heart, the inner man that God is looking at. Because that's where he wants to dwell. Dress well, yes, but let your heart also be right before God. The fact that a man is facing affliction or that a man is eating from dustbin does not mean that God has deserted that man. I, I, somebody sent me a video of a pastor who was speaking of 
he was talking to his congregants of how many pastors are dying from depression because they are trying to act as if they are superhumans to their congregants. May God deliver us. Christianity today has taken on a form that is essentially exterior, outwardly, shallow, superficial, and even artificial. You don't even know who a Christian is anymore. Just because he's holding a Bible and can quote one or two scriptures, that's all. But can he leave those scriptures? For this reason, there's the understanding of men who throng into church meetings is that if it is good, it is God. And if it is not good, it is not God. But nothing can be further from the truth. Because we know from the parable we just read that you can be rummaging through dustbin and it is God. You can, you can try everything you want to try. And if it is God's will that you won't get it, you won't get it. It's not because you are a sinner. It's because God doesn't want you to have it. And not out of wickedness. But out of his mercy and out of his love. But nobody tells us that. We are told to abhor suffering. Me and no go suffer. And no go beg for bread. We are told to abhor it. And yet the Bible says we should rejoice when we suffer for the sake of Christ. How do we correlate that song with the word of God. But because we are seeking the pleasures of the flesh, we abandon the word of God and run after the ones that we like. The two assemblies in Smyrna reveal that the church of God is not necessarily one that has an outward appearance of godliness. Neither is it one that has the trappings of worldly success. Nor is it one that makes the claim of itself as being an assembly of God. Remember, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let every one that nameth the name of God depart from iniquity. At the end of the day, does God recognize you as being of his assembly? Have you, have you departed from iniquity? Have you severed yourself thoroughly from iniquity? Indeed, in many assemblies, that have an outward appearance of godliness without being able to actually live godly, we find that inwardly they are the abode of iniquity, wickedness, and evil. And those deserving of the appellation a synagogue of Satan. Because in essence, Satan is who they are serving. Satan is who they are worshipping. Indeed, he is their God. A synagogue of Satan focuses on how much of this world they possess. It focuses on living in competition with the world. You have built a big house, I've built a big house. That's how we are doing. You have five million, I have ten million. That's how we are doing. But they, comparing themselves by themselves, are not wise. A synagogue of Satan is heavy on church rituals and programs, but extremely low on God's word. They don't leave it out on a daily basis. They don't submit to the word of God. And they are incapable of manifesting the nature or character of God. That's the fruit of the spirit. In a synagogue of Satan, sin thrives because they always cover sin. When something wrong happens, they say, don't talk about it, don't talk about it, don't talk about it. So they keep quiet and sin festers amongst them. I think we discussed that two weeks ago. That sin thrives when it is covered. So a brother is raping girls in the church. They say don't talk about it, don't talk about it. And he continues, continues. And no girl knows that this boy is dangerous. Because they don't want to talk about it. And he continues to sin. And they are happy. You see a man who is cheating people. And you don't bring him to, to the front of the church and say, this fellow is dangerous. Avoid him. No. Until he has cheated everybody in the church. 
and then he vanishes to another church. And we keep quiet. Sin thrives in the synagogue of Satan. Iniquity abounds because they lack the love of God. They don't care about anybody. They only care about themselves. We go to church. We don't know what is happening in the other person's life. We don't make phone calls. Even the pastor is not called by anybody. Pastor is, pastor is seen as a, he can do everything. He's janta manta. Whether pastor is hungry or at home or not, nobody knows. They say, a pastor has money. Don't worry, pastor has money. Until the day pastor will drop dead on the, on the altar. That's when they know that, ah, we didn't know he didn't have money. We didn't know. We didn't. Meanwhile, they are faring sumptuously. A synagogue of Satan. And if the pastor talks, they say he's only interested in money. Borrowing from the story of the fig tree caused by the Lord, those who have a synagogue of Satan, they have lots of leaves, but no fruit. Activities and rituals without relationship with God. Let's sing this hymn. Let's pray. Let's do this. Let's do this. Let's do that. That's how they do. That's, how, that's what we are doing. But ask whether God spoke to them. It doesn't matter. No fruit whatsoever. No manifestation of the Holy Spirit in any shape or form. Everything is by human effort. Or by demonic oppression or manipulation. Or power. The works of the flesh. The pastor will say something. Somebody will stand up and begin to speak in. They say, they claim his tongues. Then somebody will give interpretation. All choreographed. Technology is being used in many churches now. Pastor has an earpiece. And they are speaking. That brother's address is this. There's somebody here. Somebody here. Yes, your address is, um, your address is, um, I'm seeing, um, I'm seeing, um, if God was speaking to you, what is the MM? You should have been able to say your address is so and so and so. What is the MM? Is, is it to make people feel that you are really hearing from God? You're not hearing from God. You're just a deceiver. There's somebody here, your problem. Remember, oh, oh, Papa. Oh, Papa. It is true. It is, oh, shut up. Wicked, deceit, deceitful people. Setting a trap for others to fall into. What is true? What is true? Someone despicable, despicable tape. Oh, yes. And your friend, your friend, yes, let me see your friend. Let, let your friend come out. And you could see Hollywood at work. Yes, yes. This is your friend. Eh? Okay, you brought this person to him. I'm seeing, I'm hearing. What, guys, what is going on here? And people are clapping. Hey, he's a man of God. He's talking. He's seeing. The day he will die, he won't see. He will just drop dead. And the church will be wondering what happened. He's in hell, roasted. There's so much entertainment factor in our things now. Nothing about God. That's the synagogue of Satan. They are carnally minded and have the appearance of godliness but cannot live godly because godliness is a trait that comes from living in Christ and in the power of the Holy Ghost. You can't manufacture it. You can't force it. John the Baptist performed his work without working one miracle. And yet the Lord Jesus Christ said, of men born of woman, at least before salvation, he's the greatest. Greater than Abraham. Greater than David. Greater than Isaac, than Joseph. Name them in the Old Testament. Greater than Elijah, greater than Elisha, who worked many mighty works. John the Baptist was greater than them. And he didn't work one miracle. Why? He fully obeyed God. Obedience is better than sacrifice. What are we doing? Do you think God is interested in these miracles that we are doing? God is interested in hearts that he can indwell. Hearts that are made right as a result of studying his word and living out his word. What are we doing? The assembly of God, on the other hand, 
is essentially known for her purity, her humility, her charity, and her ability to weather well adversity. You say you are a church of God. You say you are a person that is in the church of God. There's no purity in you, no holiness. You are not humble. You don't love the brethren. You don't love other people. You don't even love God. When adversity comes, you are running helter skelter. You can't even withstand it. You're not the church of God. You're just some fellow somewhere. These are traits that are developed inwardly and they mature as a result of walking devotedly with God over years. They just don't happen overnight. You don't get born again today and you begin to manifest these things immediately. No! Enoch gave birth to Methuselah at the age of 65. And then he began to walk with God and he walked with God for 300 years. How many years? 300 years. We want to walk with God one year and start working miracles. Bible says he was not for God had taken him. Brethren, we need to examine ourselves. We need to examine ourselves to be sure of which assembly we belong. Do we belong to the assembly of God? Or do we belong to a synagogue of Satan? 2 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 5. And we'll close here. 2 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 5. Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves or prove yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. The King James says reprobate. Let me explain what reprobate means so that you can appreciate what this word disqualified is talking about. When they grab silver ingot from the ground, after cleaning it and whatever, they put it inside the crucible and begin to heat it up for impurities to go. As the impurities are coming, they are scooping out the impurities, scooping out impurities. Now, the bottom line is that the silver should be so clear that the fellow who's doing it should be able to see his image in it. Then he removes it. It is pure silver. It is what is called sterling at that point in time. That's why the Bible talks about us being in the image of Christ. We are put in that crucible until Christ can see his image and says, yes, this one is right. So they put this silver inside the fire. They've removed the impurities. But every time the silversmith is looking, he doesn't see his image in the silver. He will try, try that. He doesn't see the thing. The thing is drying, drying. Ah, what is going on here? They say, it is good for nothing. They just throw it away. It's called reprobate. That's what it means here. Check yourselves. For all that God is passing you through, can he see his image in you? When the Lord puts, passes you through tribulation, through trials, he's looking to see somebody who will behave like him in adversity. So he looks. He's not behaving like me. Why is he not behaving like me now? Let's, let's try. Let's remove some impurities. They remove. Then you will hear, repent, repent, repent. You say, what, am I, what have I done wrong again? They put you back in the heat. This heat is too much. It's too much. I'm tired. What kind of church is this? Every time. So, so suffering. So, so suffering. Look at the persons. Look at those people. They have children. They have houses. They have this. They have that. Do they have ten heads? What are they preaching in this church? I beg I'm not doing. Then you go out. And the Lord will be looking. Where is my image? He doesn't see. He's looking for somebody who, while he's being reviled, will revile me. He's looking for somebody who when they insult will keep quiet and be walking. He's looking for somebody who they will weep and will say glory be to God. This is for Christ. He's looking for people who are like him and is not seen. 
And eventually, he has to come to the sad conclusion. These are a synagogue of Satan. You remember what he told Peter? In Matthew chapter 16. He said, Thou severest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. Deep, get thee behind me, Satan. He called him of Satan. You have a synagogue of Satan. You're not interested in me. You are interested in the things that be of men, the things of the world. The Lord is looking at us. And he's wondering, where is my image in these ones? Where is my image in them? Have I not been formed in them? You will see next week that it is through tribulations, adversity, that his image is formed in us. Where is it? He said he sees people who are running away from the heat. Pursuing money. Running helter skelter. Looking for a house. Looking for a job. Looking for money. Looking for this. Looking for that. None seeketh after God. None is righteous. All mind their own things. Of which assembly are you? The assembly of God. Or a synagogue of Satan. Let's bow our heads to pray.